Yeah. So guys, I hope what I'm saying is sinking. You know, so quantitative are uh, very specific in nature, descriptive. When I'm, I'm using an example, when you can do a descriptive study, maybe you're simply analyzing the mean, the standard deviation, the mode, you know, few description of the phenomenon, you know, you're investigating. I call could be comparative, comparative in the case of um, maybe you are trying to compare two variables, you know, in correlation, you know, how does this variable affect the other? You know, it could be very comparative of relationship in time. So let that, you know, stick to your mind when you are doing a quantitative. While as qualitative questions can be very broad, sometimes when you see long research questions, you know, you usually signal this might be a qualitative question. They are open-ended, you know, tend to address what and how questions, and usually how and why in, in with case studies. So we have also variance questions that focus on difference and correlation. And then we have process questions. Those are other additionals, understand? So, but it's good you, you keep your mind, you know, focused on. And then how do you get or arrive at research questions? Usually through literature review, understand? Through literature review, you have to read a lot of papers to understand what is going on in the field. So, and then constructing the research question by gap spotting, Spot if there is a gap in research, if there is a confusion, and then if there is some kind of neglect of something, you know. But you can only arrive at this good research question when you must have. Like I've been doing, I've been doing um, um annotated bibliography, you know, for my dissertation. You know, it has been it's, it, has, it has not been very easy. Like Professor Ryan today, when I met him, when I met with him, he said, "Oh, Clement, you did a very good work. You presented almost like six dissertation, you know, right papers." In, in just one hour, you know, can you narrow it down more and more? Narrowing it down is not very easy, you know, so that, you know, when you are choosing choosing um question for dissertation, just go for something that is, professor says it's better you graduate fast and go than entering into something that you cannot finish, you know, in five years. So you want me to kind of put it down, but I've been doing, kind of doing a lot of literature review to understand what is going on and so that I can be able to spot out the gaps or the confusion or the neglect. It is not easy. Finding the papers not very easy. I understand. That's why I, what I often say it is easier to critique a paper than to write your own. It's never easy, you know. So these are things you have to keep your mind on, you know, about um, about research questions. So if you're asked to uh, design a research question quantitative, I will say what factors are responsible. Understand. Then, if I ask to do a qualitative, I mean, I, I, I might ask the same question: Why is um, is so so so? Maybe why is maybe organizational this responsible for this and that? Instead of investigating factors responsible for the changes in the organization, you simply ask the question: Why is this happening in the organization? So you want to investigate to know why, what is happening, what is responsible for what is happening in the in in the in the in the in the organization. But quantitatively, we ask what factors are responsible. And when it when you when you mention factors, it means that you are kind of want to collect numerical data, you know, based on these factors, factors that you can analyze, understand, factors that you can measure understand factors that are measurable and these factors may come in in the, in the form of the constructs you know that forms the theory that you are using but when you ask why is maybe this happening in the organization it's an open-ended and nobody knows we are what will be the end understand so you are simply going in and you can use interview focus group or any tool at your disposal to understand what is really going on, you know, which means you can collect both numerical data. You can also um, collect more, you know, of um, non-numerical data, understand? So it's very important to keep your mind on that. Now, I will stop sharing and then we move into, do you have any questions or we have anything to share about research questions? What are your thoughts about research questions? And, Hello guys, are you there? Yeah. Please, I, I plead if you can, if you come on video now, let's make this more interactive. You know, let's make this more interactive. If you, there's nobody, no teacher here. We are all students. So um, 
So what do you think about research questions? What do you think about research questions in quantitative and qualitative? So when do you need to decide uh, your research question when, what time? After you pass the qualified exam and uh, you choose your professor, then you, you decide the research question, is that correct? Yeah, usually you have to do a 547. 547 is a directed readings, understand? In the directed readings, you choose any professor of here, maybe who's gonna, maybe a professor who's gonna be your dissertation chair or any other professor that you, you don't have interest in what you wanna do. I think that's the point of emphasis. Having someone who is interested in what you want to do and someone who is like well-informed about the area and it's gonna help you to broaden your idea understand and help you to get something that will be very easy manageable for a dissertation understand so the greatest mistake you make is to you know want to investigate something that it's is very wide beyond the scope of a dissertation understand like you want to do like um you want to do something like um let's say um grounded theory you don't know where it's going to lead you because if you don't end up producing a theory, understand, making an, raising some hypothetical statement about the phenomena you are investigating, then you have not built a theory. You can only say you have built a theory to one of the um, 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 ways of evaluating um, grounded theory would be, did you raise any, did you raise any hypothetical statements about the phenomena you are investigating? Understand, so if you don't, end up raising such a hypothesis understand then it will be taken that you didn't build a theory so like it might take you much time case study could also be because you don't have control over the organization if anything changes you are doomed understand if the management changes you are doomed so the former management might grant you permission the current one might say no we don't want any so you know so so picking up your research question is usually, sometimes it's not very easy. Like when I began my own, I had some ideas about what I want to do. But then by the time you start researching, going deeper into your research, when you start reading a lot of papers, you know, you know, understanding what others have done in the, in the field, you, you have the tendency to feel like you are drifting away from your original idea, understand? So I've been working for, for more than three months now understand but if you ask me have you defined your research question i will say no i've not truly defined it understand you know so it is not easy to just to pinpoint because you have to do a lot of you know underground work literature review before you can actually be able to spot out a gap you know or confusion or whatever and then problematize you problematize that gap understand and then raise a research question by that gap but you have to back it up with previous research. Maybe say, I've investigated this phenomenon and discovered that all the research being done, carried out in the previous years, or especially in the last 10 years, focuses only on the organizational you know, uh, perspective. Now, nothing has been done you know, in the field of, um, maybe say in the field of education, you understand? since it's been commercial organization or anything. So now you want to raise that as, an, as a problem. And then that problem is, you know, kind of research question you come up with, you know, so, but you have to be mindful of what, how, why, you know, that's, you know, accompanies your question. Now, we are going to look at theory. Huh? Theory is a very serious issue. Yes, Bob? Clip, uh, yeah, Clement, I, uh, like if, if I'm doing any research on healthcare, mostly, like suppose I'm doing on a secondary data. Uh, secondary is data. it possible? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, not the primary data. Is it uh, possible to get a uh, descriptive and correlation uh, research together uh, on that? When you are using a secondary you data, secondary data, and yeah. this secondary data is based on based off on from based on where based on literature. Yeah, based on uh, analysis. A previous analysis. Yeah. 
Yeah, but when you um you 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 have to analyze. If you have a secondary data, understand, and you analyze the data, depending on whatever methodology you use to an analyzing data, you know your goal is to um spot out, you know, where to problematize your assumption. We have to raise a research question based on what you are investigating. Understand. Mm -hmm. So by analyzing the data, you could be able. The data will give you insight into. Mm -hmm. um um what whether what you want to investigate have been fully explored mm -hmm. or have not been explored understand mm -hmm. but uh, relying on secondary data completely for depending on the kind of a problem you want to investigate in healthcare otherwise i know that most healthcare problems usually requires primary data collect original mm -hmm. data from the patients or people the practitioners in the field you know it's necessary you do that then you can analyze you know, with um, secondary data can actually give you an idea of what has been done, understand? Mm -hmm. And then, but then we be need to collect, you know, um, primary data, you know, from the practitioners, mm -hmm. from the patients, or from whoever, you know, to understand what is currently happening, because things are you always changing, you know, it's yeah. always changing. Sometimes maybe you see in some papers, the maybe the last published paper maybe. Uh, four years ago or three years ago yeah. or two years ago. So if you're relying on such data, those data may no longer be answer the current question or things have must have evolved, understand, yeah. from the last time the last paper was published, the paper you are relying on the data, understand. Mm -hmm. those, that's why we always encourage to, you know, gather, um, unless yeah, you're doing like a literature review, maybe you want to review mm -hmm. some systematic literature review or some healthcare stuff, understand, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, yeah, so um, we are going to go into theory now. Theory, 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 theory. Theory is same um, kind of problematic. So Clement, the last question. Question. hello. Yeah, Clement, are you gonna do a qualitative or quantitative in your thesis? In my thesis. Yeah. If you are doing a if you are doing if you wanna do a quantitative um um research understand then you 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 will be um kind of in thinking about theory theory is very it lasts exactly what we want to say if you want to do a quantitative study that is positive study theory is your king no so way you what about you this. what are you gonna do what are you thinking what you are concerned myself myself is gonna be quantity it's gonna be quantitative like last time i explained my reason why I don't want to do qualitative, understand? But I cannot, if it comes to maybe teaching as a professor, when I graduate and get my doctorate, I can teach qualitative qualitative research. And then and then I have to validate that if I could be able to publish at least one, you know, that's why we are we are trained to conduct both qualitative and quantitative. But why I don't want to do with, deal with qualitative is because I, transcription is a problem. You, for, you know, I, like I had that experience with the paper I wrote with Professor China. I told you, the complaint, the 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 reviewers, you know, came back with whole lots of um, review information. One of those was that poor low sample. We don't have enough sample because I interviewed only ten students in Nigeria. Understand? And with that ten students, I have more than forty or fifty, you know, transcripts. You analyze and code it. So imagine when you have a significant um. Uh, sample, you know, population interview like 100 people or 200 people, you're going to battle with a lot of, if you're not good with all this qualitative data analysis software, it's, you, you know, it's going to be very difficult for you to understand. It will take you more time. So I want to run away from all those data something and deal with numbers. But the task here might be getting famili yourself familiarized with all these softwares, PLSM. I hope to use PLSM in my analysis. I will learn it very well when the time comes. You know, so can I can do survey or can I do do a quasi experimental? That's what I'm also looking at. Do a quasi experimental. You know, mm -hmm. I don't need to do any random assignments. I can simply work with an institution or two institutions and do my comparisons. You know, based on the variable factors I'm going to investigate. You know, so theory is very 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 important especially if you are doing a positivist study when you are doing positivist study and uh, you know confirm, and like to test a theory and confirm it 
Now we I'm just coming, you know. Yeah. I'm just coming now, understand. So theory is absolutely necessary. There is this contention and still strong debate, you know, among IS scholars, you know, which um these guys, you know, in their paper, you know, is theory king. I hope you must have read a paper, understand, you know, they are really bothered with what you and I are also bothered, understand? Why must we, must every research, you know, require a theoretical contribution? Must you need a theory, you know, to guide you in every research? Because sometimes there are, could be very creative and innovative um, problems solved even though they don't have any theoretical backings. You know, but most of the um, and high impact journals like MIS Quarterly, we simply discredit, understand such preference on account that it doesn't have any theoretical backing. You know, it seems as see. So, yeah. Octavio, how would you define the theoretical contribution? That's what I'm coming, you know, but you listen to me and then you get some of these things as I explain them. Okay. Know? So, yeah. So they are, we are worried, like last semester I was with, um, I did, it was a TA to Professor uh, Monk saying, a Norwegian professor, visiting professor to CGU, you know, who um, um, handled DSR. One of the problems we encountered in that class is most students will simply because you need a kernel theory for DSR, I understand. Some people will simply mention the theory in person, but their work is not informed by that theory. I understand? There is no reference to the theory in the rest of their work. They will simply mention a theory because sometimes it is very difficult to actually get a theory that will inform what you are doing, let's say in DSR, a theory that's a prescriptive theory that will give you a guideline or step-by-step, -step, understand, you know, guideline on how to design an artifact. Such theory is hard to find, if not non-existent. We don't even have one in the IX or even in design science. We don't have such grand theories. And because of the novelty of some of the artifacts we design, you know, most of these artifacts are artifacts that um, wicked problems that have not been there. They require kind of creativity and intuition. Finding a theory to guide you in designing such an artifact, it is difficult, understand? Because it is a new problem. You are coming up with some creative way of solving the problem for the organization. And finding a theory becomes a problem, you know? So this is for in design science. And also in IX, you know, being a relatively uh, recent field, understand we don't have much theories. Most of the theories are borrowed theories from behavioral sciences, understand? Most of our scholars have tried to come up with theories like, uh, okay, we have the youth out model, which some, some scholars will say it is still a model, not yet a theory, but we believe it is a theory because sometimes a, a good framework could serve as a, conceptual framework, you know, kind of a theory for you, you know. So um, we also like to have a structuration theory, we have the human capital theory, and some of the theories, some of these theories are not even particular to IX, understand. And the one we, you and I know very much, you know, very well is youth out, understand. Other theories are like borrowed, you know, borrowed theories from, from other, other disciplines. Now, one would ask, what, what is really a theory? Understand, a lot of definitions has been given. Some would say it is an explanation of what is going on, you know, in a phenomenon you are investigating, an explanation of what is going on. But that's like a common, a layman's understanding, you know, of what a theory is. But a theory could also be a kind of a systematic, rational, rigorous explanation of what is going on in reality. There we have a, a lot of theories, understand? And why there is so much emphasis in theory is because it is, seems as if that it is a, a theory that underscores the scientific basis, you know, of whatever research you're conducting. You know, such that without a theory, you know, one would say, you, you don't have any contribution to knowledge, understand? And that 
contribution to knowledge they, are, they usually emphasize is a contribution to the knowledge already defined by a theory. It's either in, in, it comes in the form of refuting a theory, like every theory have a central claim and subclaims. Understand, you know, and every theory have a statement of relationships, constructs, a way of representing the theory, kind of a model on showing the different constructs and the every explanation of the relationship between these different constructs. Um, let me open Strobe. Let me open Strobe. You know, Strobe. I mean, let me open uh, Shelly Gregor. Shelly Gregor, um, let me share from my iPad. Shelly Gregor has a very good, in fact, she is a, I don't know whether she's a woman or he. <laughs> Who knows? Is Shelly a woman or a man? Hello, guys. I'm asking if Shelly Gregor is a man or a is she a man or a woman? Yeah, I think she's a woman. Okay, she's a woman. Okay, I thought that's yeah. not Shelly. Yeah, Shelly. You know, I think she's she's um, one of the scholars, you know, that gave us a very good explanation of what theory is all about, you know, in IX. So we have a lot of theories, theories of description, theory of analysis, and the, so I'm, I'm trying to get his work now, share some relevant part of um, part of our work to refresh us a little. Um, so, Gregor, so Gregor. Um, okay, so let me share my from my iPad. So, screen me in. So, theories are very, very important. You know, um, we are going to see this night. You know, how to also build a theory. So, the theory, what I what, as I was saying before, the theoretical contribution usually comes in the way of contributing to theory. You know, that's usually the theoretical contribution there. You know, but this theoretical contribution can also have practical implication. Understand the implication to practice. You know, but at the same time. The theory, the strong contribution to knowledge is, the, is kind of a contribution to theory. It is a kind of refuting theory, understand, or a kind of expanding a theory, uh, expanding a theory that is when you are making a new contribution to that theory, or uh, kind of re re refuting a theory or modifying, you know, some statement of relationship in that theory, you know. So, so, um, Journals like MIS Quarterly, if you don't have a theory, you know, sometimes people call it a, a conceptual framework, but there's difference between a conceptual framework and a theory. Conceptual framework is a kind of explanation of what is going on in a field and the why, you know, an explanation of what is going on in the field and the why. That's a conceptual framework, you know, a theory about what is going on in the field and what is happening and the why. You know, that's a conceptual framework, whereas a theory may be an explanation of what is going on in the situation, phenomenon, or whatever you are investigating. So can you see the screen I'm sharing from my iPad? No. What is going on? My screen is already, my screen is being mirrored. You cannot minimize Zoom when you are okay, 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 when you're recording. Yeah. What is happening? Because I'm trying to share from from this device and the it's because you're recording and different people are recording. It's only capturing the screen that's recording. That's why it's not letting you oh, hear from the other ones. You gotta stop. So what is happening? So how how are we how do we solve this problem now? Stop recording. I did I did some annotations. I I did some annotations I want to briefly share with Shelley Gregor. Uh, Mohammed. Okay, okay, no problem. Since um, I can, maybe I can just read it out. To understand, you know. So, um, Shelley Gregor, when you talk about theory, usually when you are doing a positivist study, you know, positivist study. You know, theory is a conducive sine qua non. That is, you cannot do with it without a theory if you are doing a positive study. Because you want Mr. Recording, Clement? 
What? Do you want me to stop the recording? No, no. You know, let's just stay. Um, I would have wanted you to see the things, um, the annotations I did, but since the recording has imposed the constraint, let's just do it that, that way. You okay. Know? So I will try to read out the things I wanted to share. You know. Or is it, um, or is it in a, a Google Doc already? The what? Is it in a Google Doc you shared already? Uh, no, 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 no. The document is on my library. The Shelly Gregor, you know Shelly Gregor. I mean, you have. I mean, you have a Gregor. You know, a Turing IX. You can have. You have it. Understand? I'm. I'm reading from like I did an annotation on page six one six in that paper. You know, under generalization. You know, so the notion of prediction entails some conception of generality. You know, some conception of generality in order to predict what will happen in the future, we need a generalization, generalization that includes future events. Now, now look at it now. When you are doing a positivist study, quantitative study, you, you actually need a theory, understand, to, the theory becomes a lens, you know, through which you see the world, you see the phenomena you're trying to investigate. That's why among philosophers, there is this same, um, this uh, um, issue of Turing laddedness of observation. You cannot just see because reality is so messy and uh, so unstructured, and um, sometimes you don't know what you are looking at. So a theory provides you the lens. It is an explanation of what is already going on, you know, a statement of relationship, of construct of what is going on in the field. So for you to really understand the real, a phenomenon very well, it is good you understand, you know, what is already going on in that field, understand? So whatever you are doing will be in sync with what other researchers have done in the field in relation to the particular phenomenon you are trying to study. There are people who have done some stuff on that, um, um, on that area. So you might need to look at what they have done. And the, pro and the theory provides you, you know, very good lens to look at what, you, you know, theory will tell you, understand since you let's say you are investigating let's say about fuel efficiency in a car the children might tell you okay why not look at um the injection system understand look at the aer aerodynamism understand of the car and all this stuff you know a theory will tell you actually where you are going to look at you know what you are going to look at you know when you are investigating a phenomenon without a theory you'll be just like someone who is um um lost in a very wide you know in a very wide ocean you know we, we don't someone who doesn't have a let's call it a, a geographical compacts understand you don't have a gpx route you are just lost in the whole wide world because you don't know what you are looking at understand so the theory pinpoints you know, look at what you are going to look at you know if you want to investigate this area you know so like you thought we tell you okay you are interested in understand you predict understand how consumers will accept a new technology. Okay, what you are going to look at, look at performance expectancy, look at effort expectancy, look at a social, um, what do you call it? Um, social, as I should be, who remembers um, this, that construct, um, social norms, no, uh, social, we have the facilitating conditions, and then we have the, the XI, which I've forgotten. If you remember it, let me know. So um, these are what the theory is telling you that these variables, understand, is what is going to show you or help you to understand, you know, um, prediction about the adoption of technology, understand. Without the youth out, tell me, what, where are you going to start with? If you want to study adoption of technology in IX, you don't absolutely know where to stand. So you have to look at the theory, understand the theory will tell you, look at the things you have to look at if you want to understand this better. But then in the process of your study, you might also discover there are some other factors. You know, you discover why you are studying, that is you are expanding the theory. You could also discover that, oh, it doesn't work in this situation. You say, oh, this theory doesn't hold in this area. Understand? So your contribution to knowledge is all about the contribution you are making to that theory. Understand? Which have um, might have some implication to practice, depending on the kind of nature of the question. Last time we discussed about practical 
um, questions, uh, research questions, and the conceptual. You might be contributing to understanding a phenomenon which is just at the level of conceptual or some practical problems you want to solve, which has implication to practice, you know. So, and one thing about theory, especially when you are doing, so we call it um, confirmatory theory. We have exploratory theory, so we have confirmatory. So uh, this is all about the routes you are taking, understand? It's a confirmatory. You are using this theory to confirm, understand? You use a theory, which means what, what happens is in positive study, you need a theory. You take up a theory about the phenomenon you want to investigate, and then you raise hypothetical questions, understand? You say, I hypothesize that performance expectancy will have a positive influence on behavioral intention, you know, in adopting a piece of technology, you know, in a high school or in an organization or whatever, you know. That's what we call the hypothetical deductive method, which, which Popper, you know, paid so much emphasis on. So in this case now, you are texting this theory with that hypothesis you raised, you are texting the theory. You are trying to confirm the theory. But Popper will say, you are not trying to confirm the theory. You are trying to refute the theory. So your prediction about, um, about uh, the phenomenon you are investigating might come out to be true. So when it comes out to be true, you wouldn't say you have confirmed already because there could be errors understand. It could be, it could be that what you actually found to be relationship to be significant may be as a result of um, 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 uh, what you call um, um, chance. It could be as a result of chance. There could be some errors. It could be internal errors, you know, errors of internal validity or external errors, understand, you know, that comes in. So that's always an error factor, you know, when you are doing quantitative research, you know, say, um, it's a, um, what we call it, um, um, what um, error, so there is always an error factor in every measurement when you are measuring with your with your instrument. Understand? So that's why that's why when we choose the p-value to be 0 0.05 in I, in IX, we are doing so because we are leaving some percentage of error. Understand? There's a five percent chance that we might not predict accurately, and therefore all our all our prediction in IX is mostly probabilistic. It is not like certain. They said, okay, you found a significant relationship. Some other authors might decide to replicate your study and discover that you were wrong. Understand? So it is kind of probabilistic predictions that we do, not like certainty. They will say that science does not thrive on certainty. There's nothing like absolute certainty in science. Understand? You know, probability, you know, when you talk of the Bayesian, you know, in the light of evidence, you know, something becomes much more probable that this is going to happen. Understand? So when you are dealing with a theory, usually in why we are emphasizing quantitative, that is positive study, because the positivists believe that reality is their objective, you know, realism, understand? Yeah, and you cannot have access to this reality, and this uh, reality is quantifiable, it is measurable, understand? So whatever data you are gathering is mainly numerical data, it could be discrete variable, so it could be continuous variable, numerical in the interval, you know, ratio scale, understand? It could be also dichotomous, ordinal variables, which you need to code, you know, code it if you're using a software, you code dichotomous um, variables, like which is yes, maybe a one for male, two for female, one for yes, or two for no, you know, or one for true and then two for false, you can code such variables, understand? And then you use the Likert scale, you know, Likert scale, which is kind of an, an interval scale, understand? You know, so you are using all these things to measure um, this construct of a theory, having raised some hypothetical question. That's why when you are doing a positive study with your theory in place, you must have a hypothesis. You must have a hypothesis. You may not state clearly your research question because most papers you read they don't really have research questions very clearly spelled out. But the research question could be could come in the in the nature of the hypothetical statements 
understand the different hypotheses. You might have one, two, three, four, five hypotheses as much as you can understand about the phenomenon based on the kind of the theory you are using. So it is all about trying to test the theory. Like Papa would say, all testing in science is all is, is about trying to refute refute a theory. You want to see, understand if a theory holds true. Now, for us to have good theories, we really need inductive to make inductive inferences. We need in um, um, induction. Understand? Because with induction, we could be able to make more general statements that will apply to the future. And that's the problem with Popper and the, why he said he rejected confirmation. And that's why he's an inductive skeptic. He's a, a skeptic. But the Utah theory will tell you we can predict, understand, and the adoption of technology, even if we even with future reference, understand. So even before adopting the piece of technology in the organization, studying with Utah, you know, will already tell you what's most probable um, experience of that organization or the people in it with regard to that particular piece of technology. So every theory, every theory, you know, um, must have some kind of um, make predictive statements, understand? And that's why for us to understand, you know, the phenomenon we are studying in positive studies, we need a theory. And the theory will help us to understand better the causal mechanisms and the structures underlying the observed is things, the observed um, um, reality. So there is no, when you, you are using, when you are using a theory in positive study, you must have a hypothesis, we mentioned that. And you must have, on, try to understand the, the causal mechanisms, you know, the structures that are responsible, you know, the observed regularities or irregularities that exist. And what you do is when you are, uh, gathering your data you are trying to analyze and the data gives you insight into what is happening you know in the phenomenon you are studying so we need to understand causal mechanisms but there are also times we can use a theory but our interest may not be to understand we may be purely descriptive so we are going to see that you know a straw straw also gave us um, there are different types of theories in ix you know he mentioned that we have a theory of analysis, which says what is the theory, you know, does not extend beyond analysis and description. Understand? This a theory doesn't extend beyond analysis or description. It may be a kind of descriptive statistics, statistical study. Understand? You are not interested in any. In one of the qualifying exams, we are asked to do a causal and non-causal study. A causal and a non-causal study. We have a theory of explanation. Explanation is how, when, why, where things. The theory provides explanation, but does not aim to predict with any precision. Understand? It's simply an explanation. But remember, explanation in science is all about trying to understand, you know, what is happening. And what is happening is a metaphysical, a metaphysical question. What? is happening. Quit means you are trying to understand the unobserved, unobserved mechanisms that is responsible for the observed effect. That's why every attempt of explanation is a kind of a causal, understand? You need to understand, for you to explain an event is to describe how it actually happened. What is responsible? The chain of, um, um, the chain of um, events that is responsible for, for the whole, understand, you know? So there is a, a chain of reactions that is responsible for the effects you are observing. So for you to explain, for a theory to explain, the theory might also need to understand the causal mechanisms. But there are times, like Trostrob is saying that, saying that it doesn't aim to predict, understand? It doesn't want to make a prediction, but we usually don't use this kind of theory only explanation in IX. No, you know, we have a theory of prediction. A theory of prediction, you know, gives well-developed justificatory causal explanations. Causal. Because there's no way you can predict. The youth is meant to predict. 
understand you are using the youth to want to predict technology adoption and for you to predict understand you need to design a kind of a causal a causal um, um, research design because you want to understand the regularities or the irregularities the unobserved um reality of what is going on then we have explanation and prediction this is what usually we use in 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 ix so it says what when how where provides prediction um with the textable proposition and causal explanations you know so in ix where you do we do more of explanation and prediction then we have design science design and action which gives us like principles of form and function you know of constructing an artifact you know so and every every theory must have a means of representation you know kind of um the diagrams, tables, you know, models, prototypes, system, you know, there's some kind of drawing showing the different, you know, this theory, the models, so in a, that's why in every theory there are dependent and independent variables in every theory. Dependent, you may, ha you may have one or more dependent variables, but there is a chain, like using the UTAT, for instance, understand, we have all the independent variables at the at the left side and then we have behavioral intention and the usage is kind of um, the dependent variable understand so all the independent variables are trying to uh, provide an explanation of what's going on in the in the the or they are, they are predicting understand under this circumstance the behavioral intention will kind of have direct effect on usage when using a technology is less burdensome or easy to handle like free from effort, effort expectancy, people are most likely to adopt it, you know, so behavioral, so effort, um, effort expectancy, you know, no, performance expectancy and performance expectancy, for instance, you know, it will enhance, you, it will enhance the job you are doing, understand, or effort expectancy, they will have a direct effect on behavioral intention, you know, for people to adopt the technology. So this is a kind of relationship that this dependent and so every theory have a statement of this relation have always constructs dependent variables and the independent variables. The dependent variables are usually at the left and the dependent variables usually at the right. Understand when you go into PLSM, then you understand the the inner structural model is where you think about this um, dependence and all these variables. You look at them. The outer structure measurement. You look at their measurements because each of them must have measurements. And now, so there has to be a statement of constructs, you know, construct and the relationship. There are all types of primary construct of a theory should be defined. Many different types of constructs are possible. For example, observational. One thing about constructs in theory is that these constructs are kind of measurable. They are measurable, understand? It's not just, coming up with a state construct because a construct is a kind of conceptual you know description of what is going on in the reality understand let's say someone is studying you are studying about um, okay let's say use the youth out you know technology adoption understand so you came up with effort expectancy performance expectancy understand for instance what is effort expectancy what is performance expectancy? There has to be an operational definition about the construct. And then there is a difference between dictionary definition and the operational definition of a construct. Understand? A dictionary might have a way of explaining um, an idea, understand? Which may not be measurable. But in social science and the natural sciences, we deal with operational definitions. Operational means that they can be measured. Understand? You they can be so each construct that constitutes you know part of a theory must be a measurable construct. That's why when you are raising a hypothesis using that construct, you are going to measure the construct. You are going to measure the construct. So it has to be measurable in numerical terms. Understand? It has to be it has to be quantifiable so if you raise a hypothesis that is not measurable it means that the problem is from the construct that informs the theory you are measuring 
And then another problem when you are defining a theory about the construct is, are you truly sure that the construct represents what you say you want to measure? That's where we talk about construct validity. You cannot tell me you want to measure intelligence and then you are looking at um you are looking at um, um let's say uh, uh maybe how well the child um, um performs in in sporting activity maybe say okay let's say let's say you say skillfulness you use skillfulness as a construct and then what you asked, what are you trying to measure? You want to see, you know, measure the intelligence questions, you know, how intelligent this child is. And then someone would ask you, what has skillfulness got to do with intelligence? Understand? What does it have to do with intelligence? You, 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 you say you're measuring intelligence. You are talking about skillfulness. It's unrelated, you know. You know? So you, you, are, you, don't, you have a wrong construct. You are measuring the wrong construct understand so if you say you want to measure like what you are interested you want to understand you know the abilities the intellectual abilities of these kids you know how well they perform in their grades how fluent they are how their capacity to for problem solving understand you know how fast they could understand things going on when they are taught oh these are the things you want to understand about the these kids in the classroom that was okay the base construct to address this problem you want to solve is intelligence okay intelligence should be the construct because intelligence captures all these things you are talking about and not skillfulness that is having a good construct i don't know if it is very clear because i'm trying to explain it in a very clear way that i wouldn't want you to like bother yourself again till, till you leave CGU about understanding what this construct means, understand. So now you are interested in understanding their intellectual abilities, their cognitive abilities. So what is that general term that captures all these aspects of their, of their education? Because there are many other things, understand. For instance, when you look at the, the taxonomy, you know, Bloom's taxonomy of education, there are different levels in that taxonomy one beats on the other you have the cognitive understand you have also the psychomotor understand you know so the psychomotor might be very good when you're talking about the skills they can acquire i mean through achieving that education but since you're interested in the intellectual abilities the problem solving ability the performance in grading and all this stuff so oh the construct that captures this is intelligence so you have a very good you have construct validity understand which means this construct captures this phenomenon you want to study. If you are talking about skillfulness, whereas you want to measure intellectual abilities, everyone will disagree with you, say, no, 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 this is not the right construct. Now you have construct validity by measuring intelligence because it addresses actually what you want to know about their cognitive abilities, intellectual abilities and the rest. Now, another problem that you face in defining the construct of a theory is, how do you measure you know we talk about the content validity of the construct content validity what are all the things what are the various aspects of intelligence that i need to look at understand what are the various aspects okay we say intelligence if you define intelligence only based on grade performance the average gpa then someone would tell you no Intelligence is not all about their intellectual performance in class. You know, how much grade they make. That, that is not enough, understand? So there are other as factors that needs to come. Maybe you say you're gonna check, uh, maybe use a standardized, their performance on standardized testing. You are going to check their, um, maybe speech fluency, and then you're gonna check their problem solving ability. You are going to check out their maybe say quantitative and qualitative. Usually, the most education system, like in Nigeria, they say that we have quanti qualitative and quantitative and the verbal aptitude text. Understand when they want to um, um, conduct an entrance examination. Understand 
you know, the quantitative, the qualitative and verbal aptitude test, understanding. So all this is like trying to capture every domain of evaluation, that of intelligence of the child, because they're trying to evaluate the intelligence of the child, you know, to, to place him in a secondary school, you know, to know if actually he's qualified to go move over to the next level in education, understand? So that the texting involves every aspect of what should be measured. So when it comes to intelligence, you bring in qualitative, maybe quantitative, verbal attitude, you know, performance on standardized testing. But if you, if there are five things, if there are five things that constitutes the domain of intelligence, and you mention you and you have these five things, then you have content validity. You have content validity. If you mix one among all this, then you don't have content validity, which means you are not measuring every aspect of that phenomenon. Understand? So that is about content and the construct of validity. Usually, when we are working with existing theories, it is easy because the Previous theories have already defined these constructs, the operational definition, that is the performance expectancy means that, you know, in discharging a job, uh, um, that the use of the, this piece of technology will be free from effort. Understand? That's the operational definition. You have to define it. And then the measures. The, the measures comes in, 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 the, in the form of questions. Understand? If I can, if I can get... Uh, you thought, let's say, uh, let me say, say, say fast if I can get you thought, because we are, we are talking about theories, understand, you know, and then um, these are most of the things you're going to, if you are critiquing a paper in qual, in a qualitative exam, these are the things, the kind of things you are looking at. You may look at the paper and say, oh, no, 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 this paper doesn't have construct validity. They don't have content validity. You know, even their hypothesis is not even measurable, understand, you know, they don't have a, there's one, one of the papers we reviewed during our own time, you know, they, they brought in human capital, human capital as a construct to youth out. They added human capital as a new construct to the youth out theory. And the question we raised then is, what is the operational definition of, the, of human capital? What is the operational definition? How is it to be measured? Because the authors didn't state how human capital should be measured. It's a problem. So you don't just bring in any construct and add it to a theory. You have to state how it can be measured. And you have to ensure you have content validity and construct validity, you know? Even if when you, even if you are adding, maybe you are borrowing um, a construct from another, another field. Oh, I'm trying to get at you thought. Um, yeah. Yeah, so most of the, when we talk about the content validity, usually it comes up, um, uh, you thought, I'm getting it now first. Uh, no, 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 this is not Davis. Uh, 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 no, 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 peer review. I wish some of you have all these things handy so that we can just share it first and then, you know, because I want to make reference to all this so that you can understand very clearly what we mean. Mm. I'm trying to search, go through, go through my library. Maybe you could share since he's also recording. Maybe it will work. You, you, you. You, um, I'm searching for. Because um, it'd be nice to see it on the screen. Yeah, I don't know. You see, this idea of uh, giving uh, Mohammed a uh, uh, permission to share, it, it's not. I don't know. It has a lot of constraints, you know. So we might need to review it some other time and then. Um, but if you have youth out, if you have the youth out, you can just open it up and then I'm going to where I'm, you know, trying to pull it up from my library. Uh, then um, consumer acceptance that it was a unified view. Okay, I have it here now. Now, so having defined the, the construct, you have now content, you have the construct validity. The construct actually captures what you said you want to measure. That is, the construct validity asks the question, are you really sure that you are measuring what you claim to be measuring? Understand, that is the construct validity are you sure that what you you claim you are measuring is what you are measuring understand you 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 can't you can't tell me you are you are you are you are trying to measure uh, the mileage of a car you know maybe fuel consumption of a car understand that is what you want to measure understand and then you are looking at um the um 
the uh, infotainment system in the car. And you say, you no, no, you have to, you are looking in the wrong direction. Go look at the right direction, understand. So most of them, that is the, for your construct, you know. Then the content validity, I'm giving you example with youth out now, performance expectancy, you know, is already defined using a technology will be free from effort. And then how is he measured? Understand, it's measured by questions you ask. Understand, I would find the system useful in my job. Using the system enables me to accomplish the task more quickly. Using the system increases my productivity. If I use the system, I will increase my chances of getting a raise. We have one, two, three, four. We have only four measurement scales for measuring performance expectancy. These four gives you the content validity. Four. If you drop one of the questions, you lose the construct, you, you lose the content validity. So whenever you are working with the performance expectancy, it will always be four. Because these are the four questions you will collect through your survey. Understand, when you design your survey, you are this, your survey will reflect these four questions. Now, if you are taking this performance expectancy outside of this original setting, the organizational setting where it was validated, then you might need to rephrase some of these words. Understand? You might need to change, you kind of adapt, we call it adapting. You have to readapt, you know, the, 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 all these questions. And for you to adapt this question, maybe um, it says here, um, using this, the system enables me to uh, accomplish my tasks quickly. Yeah, it's talking about system, understand. Your own might be using uh, this handheld device understand you know will help me to accomplish my my job quickly the first one says i will find a system useful for my job understand so if your own might be i might find um the use of the human resource management software very useful for my job that is that you are doing adaptation but when you adapt understand when you adapt to a new context that is you are no longer stored in this particular context of organization where this theory and the construct were validated. You are taking it to a new field to test the youth out in a new field, to test the theory in a new field, in a new, con in a new context. Understand? You need to uh, readapt th these wordings. And when you, lose, when you adapt these wordings, they might lose the original psychometric measures. Understand? If you read um, Straub, on instrument validation. She said, when you change the wordings, you have to do a pilot testing again. Understand? Unless you are retaining the words exactly and you are using it in a similar context, but in as much as you are taking it to a new area and you are adjusting, little changing in wordings, you know, in, the, in, in these questions that, that, are, that are the measures of their particular construct of performance expectancy, you have to do a pilot text, maybe with a small group to, un to know if, to understand if you really have reliability, understand, you know, understand if you have reliability, you know, whether they, it is consistent, their understanding is very consistent, you know, across the different maybe ages or demographic, um, 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 across the demographics, understand you know, to know if there is consistency in the way they answer the questions. So you have to change the, have to do a little adaptation unless you want to use it the way it is stated here. So preview theory already provides solve this problem for us. You see, why it is good. In fact, if you have a good theory, you are, I mean, it, you enjoy doing a positive study. But, but the problem is getting a good theory that will inform what you are doing. If you have a good theory, understand, you already, the work becomes easier for you because you already know where you are going. So the, usually the challenge we have is finding a theory, a theory that will direct, understand, will help you to, under, that will inform, you know, the, your whole research. Your whole research revolves around a theory. Your contribution to you know, research will be to around built around that theory. It is difficult to find one 
understand? And why? Because the existing theory might not address every aspect of the phenomenon you are studying. And that's why most times you see um, um, researchers, you know, borrowing some constructs from other fields and adding them to youth out, understand? Because taking the theory to a new context, there might be need for more constructs. Like when um, Van Katesh et al, after validating the youth out in the organization, they decided to do youth out too, remember? And the youth out too was in another context in a commercial context. They investigated mobile phone penetration users in Hong Kong and collected a massive amount of data. And then they realized that there is need for additional constructs, understand? In fact, there are some other factors, call it factors. There are fact other factors that we are responsible you know, for predicting mobile phone adoption in that commercial setting. They now realize that price value is very important because in the organizational setting, we are you you thought one was validated. Understand? You know, people are given these computers. This system, the organization provides it for them to use. Understand? But in a commercial setting, people have to buy it. So sometimes affordability comes in there. If I can afford this, so it's no longer whether this technology will be. Uh, free from efforts, whether it will enhance my job performance, but it, I'm not saying, can I afford it? Understand? So price value came in in the Utah too, you know, together with the hedonic motivation and um, and um, habits. Understand? So they added additional three constructs, and this is exactly what happens. And when they took these constructs, the hedonic motivation has already been validated in a particular literature. So they adopted, they adapted the original understand, the understanding, you know, operationalization and the measures and adapted it to the youth out. They also used, they didn't come in, they, did, they were not the first to talk about hedonic motivation. They were not the first to talk about price value. There are other theories already. There is a theory that handled price value. So they took this price value from that a theory. And they referenced it. If you read the youth out too, they referenced, you know, in the in the um, instrument validation and measures, you know, they mentioned for each construct, price value, you don't need, they mentioned the papers, you know, the previous papers, we had they adapted these theories, we had adapted these constructs from, and then added it to the youth out. Now we have a new type. Who knows in the future, we might have youth out three. Don't you think so? Yeah, so we might have youth out of three. It's a matter of maybe, you know, taking the youth out two again to another context. You know, it might reveal the need for another variable, another factor that we predict, understand, you know. It's so this question. Uh, space area. I got the way this launch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe yeah, the adoption of, um, you know, yeah. To predict, yeah, predict possible adoption, maybe possible and the adoption yeah. of um, maybe um, different some, some space, right? some space reality. Understand? You might some other consideration might pop up. So that's why most times what we do in IX is like we have the youth out, then we look for some other constructs from other theories to add to the youth out. Or you can also come up with a a new theory. Understand? Come up with some other theory that is not. That is not IX. It is still acceptable. Understand, but the issue is that you need a theory. The fact if we are doing a positive for, for some time now, we've been talking about positivist study because of its emphasis on theory. In fact, the theory is king, like Straub. Straub was the person who raised that idea, who was mentioned that the theory is actually king. Understand? You can do a positivist study, you know, without having a theory. You know, who is going to accept it, even if you make good contribution to knowledge? Even if you solve the practical problem, understand. People like Popa will dis discharge it. Understand. There was, Popa will not accept. Popa will accept your work as unscientific, anecdotal. Understand. Because you don't have a theory. Understand. So that's the problem. You don't have a theory. And when you don't have a theory, it means that your work is not scientific. That's what they are trying to say. Understand. Because every 
what distinguishes us as scholars, IA scholars is like that contribution to knowledge we are making. And so it's very necessary. So these questions are the content validity. Some are measured with four questions. Some are measured with five questions. And each of these questions are not just arbitrary questions. Each of these questions capture a certain domain of the construct. Understand? So for instance, in social influence says, influence, people who influence my behavior think I should use the system. People who are important to me think I should use the system. People who influence my behavior and people who are important to me are not the same. Remember, understand, you know? So the third one said the senior management of this business, you know, and has been helpful in the use of the system. And then in general, the organization has support. You know, the organization has supported the use of the system. You see, so this captures social influence, every aspect of social influence from the people who influence you, from the people who are important to you, from the organizational um, senior management providing support, and then the general organization support for the system. You know, so you have content validity. So the danger is if you are defining a new construct, maybe you want to, you come up, you came up with a new construct, maybe not from an existing theory, you will face a lot of challenges. You will face a lot of challenges. And the challenge is, are you sure you have cost the construct validity? Another thing is the content validity. How are you sure? How are you going to measure? Because these things are the, actually the measures. These questions are the measures. Understand? If you take this same thing to PLSM, it is the outer measurement. Understand? And this is the outer measurement that signals the validity and the reliability. If you don't have very, very, um, validity and the reliability of these measures, you can't go into the structural model. Understand? You can't go into the structural model. So this is absolutely necessary. So when you are working with a theory, understand, so be very careful. And then dropping, dropping, if you don't have a serious justification for dropping any of these constructs of a theory, understand? If you don't have any a serious justification grounded in, in research, you don't drop. You don't drop because if you are dropping an aspect of a construct, understand, which means, the, con the content validity, understand, in terms of the, con the number of constructs that define the whole idea of a theory, you, you, something is missing, understand? You, what makes you doubt a theory, understand, or a model in our field is all the constructs, understand, that informs it, you know? The performance expectancy, effort expectancy, social influence and facilitating conditions with all the moderating variables, understand? So if you drop facilitating condition and then replace it with some other thing, you are diminishing the value of the model. So something you have to provide justification for doing that. Otherwise, it's better you add new constructs to the theory and test it to the model and test it than to drop the original constructs in the model. When you drop any of them, it means it ceases to be you out you are using. Understand? It may be something else. Because what defines this as a model for prediction is covered by these independent variables at the left side. Understand? And the dependent variable here at the center is behavioral intention. They are predicting behavioral intention. So, so far, you, do you have any questions? And then so that we can go on. I still have some things to share. So, so far, what, what do you think about um, this theory? And uh, we're still talking about positivist studies, I'm talk mostly confirmatory theories, understand? We can have, have also exploratory theories. And when do, you, when do you use exploratory theories? Understand? You use exploratory theories when the theory is still at its nascent stage, when nothing much you know, has been done in that field of study. Nothing much has been done in that field of study. So the, the theory, theory is still in development. 
understand there are theories that are kind of theories that are grand theories that have already you know you know every theory there is something you have to know you know about 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 every theory every theory has like four important um characteristics one it must be you know fruitfulness the ease with which it generates new predictions and it must be parsimonious you know make a fewer fewer assumptions and then progressiveness you know novelty you know in of predictions and progress in understanding that it leads and then the last one is consistency the extent it is free from internal contradictions you know doesn't violate the assumption of other theories if you are building a theory so usually we mention a lot of parsimony parsimonious making fewer assumptions a theory cannot say everything remember every theory have a scope we are going to see it later every theory have a scope it doesn't it doesn't account for everything in the world every theory has a domain where it can explain and it explains with fewer predictions understand with you know um very clear novel prediction and fewer assumptions about everything that lies within the scope of that theory it is because of scope that we can talk about grand mid-range and the contextual theories contest bound theories is because of the scope I understand so so far what do you have to say about you know do you guys understand about content validity construct validity the measures statement of relationship which are these constructs understand so if you're asked to use a theory now any question bob do you have any question is it very clear so far mike uh I don't have any question. I think I need to revisit this whole thing and um, come up with any question. I'll text on the WhatsApp group. Okay. Right, right now, too much to process. I was just thinking, it's like, <laughs> I'd rather read this one once again and get back to you. I'm sure I'll come up with some questions in mind. Okay. So, again, another question I have have any question yeah by the time you go back to read again it might make more it may be more reasonable to you but re remember mm -hmm. most of these things we're saying here we are kind of giving it an opportunity yeah. in very in a very concise way understand so that um it will be easier for you to understand. even if you don't go back to read it at least you should understand what is content validity construct validity and the constructs you know, that represents a theory and then um, what all this means for a theory. Just wondering how many books have they like a re, yeah, I mean the class maybe, yeah, we took the class like uh, two years ago. Just wondering how many books, new books they added in. So maybe we need to like uh, compare that the, uh, the syllabus, yeah. Yeah, we have, um, you have access on, um, you have, I posted a link, you know, oh, okay. to our yeah, resources. You can oh. check the folders, you know, look for papers, you know, but basically um, when it comes to theory and the new papers, there isn't, there isn't much um, uh, new information because most of these things have been part, already defined the principles of, um, social science they don't change theories they won't come up tomorrow and tell you a theory a theory definition of a theory have changed so with other papers sometimes what the papers they add uh, maybe if students have so much complaint about a particular paper understand then they bring a new one or newly published papers on the field and um, or new books you know that are more simpler you know are more clearer than the previous ones you know but basically what is what is um, like okasha what is okasha saying that Godfrey Smith didn't say already. Understand? Godfrey Smith is a compendium. He addressed every question that needs to be addressed in the philosophy of science. They changed to the Akasha, up, updated with Akasha because um, students were like complaining it's too difficult to understand. It's, it's, not, it's not because um, Akasha said anything new. Understand? Godfrey Smith is an authority, you know, in that field. 
So, so no new questions about um, so far about theory. Uh -huh. So, uh, Shelley Gregor, so every theory, you know, because we use theory in qualitative and in quantitative studies, you know, with, when we have, a, we have a theoretical framework, we can always make generalizations. So generalization is another important aspect of them. Um, you know, what you need to know about the theory, when you have a theory, you can be able to make a generalization. And this generalization are usually based on like predictions you are making, you know? So the idea of causality, you know, is very important in every theory. And then straw a kind of trying to look at the different types of theories, you know? And then how many of them that are, are used in IX? understand and then he came up with this the theory of analysis is only frequency is three explanation four prediction one explanation and prediction 33 33 design and action nine total of frequency of occurrence 50 so among these 50 33 you know so between march 2003 to 2004 in the classification in articles in mi squatley an information system. Who knows? If you check from 2004 to maybe to date, maybe more theories might have been added. You know, maybe more more of explanation and prediction. More of explanation and prediction. So if you're asked to like design a causal, um, a cause. Okay, let me not go there now. Let me talk about, okay, with, um, I was talking about confirmatory, understand the theory and the exploratory theory, understand. You know, qualitative studies, you know, theories does exactly the same job, you know, as in, in a quantitative. But one thing you should notice about qualitative studies is mostly we have a lot of theory building instead of positivist theory texting. Actually, you can have a positivist case to study, a positivist case study that is meant to text an existing theory. But more or less, most qualitative researchers, you know, aim at you know developing theory. You know, we have the grander theory, which is an at, always attempt to you know um, come up with theory based on the data, you know, the empirical data that is being analyzed in the context. So we have more of in you know inductive theory building understand we can also we also build theory theories in positivist in in positivist study understand but usually you have an existing theory you start you start off with an existing theory and then you might end up you know building a new theory like in design science you can at the end you know come up with um, a design theory understand so you can actually build a theory but in qualitative studies Maybe mostly, you know, uh, exploratory, understand, exploratory theory building. When we do exploratory theory building, understand, that is when nothing much, you know, has been documented in research about a the theory. Researchers usually favor PLSM because it maximizes the explained variance, you know, it must imagine the explained variance in the dependent variable. So, so researchers go, so when you are doing like an exploratory theory texting, understand, theory building, exploratory theory building, PLSM is a very good statistical method to be used in that approach. To understand and it tolerates non normality of data. Understand it's also be good when you don't have like too big a sample to be used. So, if you read the hair book, hell will tell you that PLSM is good when you are doing an exploratory theory building research. Understand you are creating a new theory. Understand that's why. Um, 
instead of doing a factor analysis, you know, uh, understanding the commonalities and narrowing down your variables to do a regression, PLSM takes care of the whole thing for you. Understand? It takes care of the whole thing for you. So, so that's when you do like an exploratory, you know, theory building in in IX. You can also when you want to do like a confirmatory, you know, theory testing. Confirmatory, you want to confirm the theory. It's a kind of refuting, you know, Papa would say, you know, you use um, other covariate based. You can use like ANOVA, conduct a kind of experiment. Understand? When you are conducting an experiment, you, are, you have a theory in place already. And then you are texting this theory. It is a confirmatory theory texting when you're doing an experiment. You cannot conduct an experiment when nothing much has been documented or known about the theory. I think we are losing him. Is it kind of frozen or I'm frozen? <laughs> no, I, 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 you were. Oh, I'm listening. Am I frozen? You were no, frozen. No, you're good now. Head. You were frozen. Now oh, you're good. I, I'm frozen. Okay. Okay, I'm good now, right? Okay. Yeah, because I there's a signal that my bandwidth was low. You know, my network was a kind of unstable, but you can hear me now. You know. Yeah. So we're talking, yeah, we're talking about um 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 confirmatory and um, and the exploratory theory, you know, exploratory theory building and confirmatory. So so what I was saying is if you are doing an experiment, uh, doing an experiment, you must have a already theory in place, a well-defined theory in place for you to, to do an experiment. Understand, you know. So you can have um, the two different groups, you know, the, um, the control group and then, and then what was the other group in experiment? You have two groups when you are conducting an experiment. And who reminds me of the two, the control group and then, and the other one is what? There is the experiment group and the control group. Eh? The uh, control group and the experience group. And the experiment group, yeah. So one no. of them, one you of them. I have an experiment group. Huh? We don't have an experiment group. We, see, we have it, the control group and the, and the, there is, there is I'm, I'm just trying to, recall the actual word we use in describing these things understand you know sometimes we forget some of this word um and the okay the treatments right yeah the treatment okay 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 that's what you mentioned okay i didn't hear you clearly yeah the treatment group and the control group so the treatment is we are actually where you are manipulating understand where you are manipulating but whatever manipulations you are doing are based on um um the affordances of that of the theory you are using so you are not just simply yeah there is something you are trying to text about the theory you are using so if you don't have a well-defined theory there's no way you can actually do an experiment or begin to conduct some do some manipulations understand because the manipulations you are trying to do you know to the treatment group is actually based on on the theory so Experiment, experimentation, or quasi experimentation. How many types of how many types of um, experiments do we have? Who remembers? How many types of experiment do we have? Like, are you talking about like quasi experiment? One, one. Uh, there is like the gold standard uh what is that called uh, we have the true experiment true experiment now we have the quasi experiment uh, 
what else is there? Is there other stuff? Non-experiment. Non-experiment, yes. Yes. In non-experiment, you have no, no manipulations at all. Understand? Because what, what really defines an experiment is that manipulation. Yeah. There is always a manipulation when you are doing an experiment. In non-experimental, maybe you are dealing with variables like demographic data that doesn't need any kind of experimentation, understand? You know, we don't usually do non-experiments, understand? Uh, people can do quasi-experimental. A lot of IS research papers are uh, quasi-experimental. In a quasi-experimental, there is no random assignment of um, participants to any group. There's no random assignment, understand? That's it, but there is a manipulation. Understand, there is always a control group and a treatment group, but there's no random assignment. That's why it is quasi-experimental. If I'm going to do my dissertation, I'm most probably looking at doing a quasi-experimental. Understand? So if you are doing a true experiment, true experiment, there has to be a random assignment. And you know it's not easy. It comes with a lot of costs and they have to more a, a kind of um, um, mobilize, or do I mind using the wrong word? Understand, you have to, a lot of money goes into it, understand? For people to leave whatever they are doing to be somewhere. And they, because you know, a, a experimentation has to do with a kind of randomized control trial that they use in healthcare, you know? Randomize, keep on randomizing, you know, the population, keep on randomizing until you'll be able to uncover, you know, irregularities, understand, or observe regularities in, in the way, you know, if, if it is could have ANOVA, maybe you have a need to, you know, uh, two or more groups, like maybe have three groups. So it, it's not easy. And then with all the, all the requirements for assumptions that has to be fulfilled, like a quality of variance and the rest, you know, it's not easy and the demographics has to be like equal you know you can use men women and children if you're like depending on the kind of experiment there's always had to be a random assignment randomized assignment but there has to be you know quality of variances among you know standard deviation has to be equal and the rest and uh, assuring that such um assumptions are met in practice is not easy that's why I wouldn't encourage anybody to go into experimentation. Unless maybe you are working in an organization where you have full control, understand, where you can always change things. But it's not easy for you because you are working with human subjects and they could introduce a lot of biases. Maybe some might have known so much about what you want to do. They have prior information. I usually need a kind of neutrality. If you want to conduct a good experiment. Maybe you want to test the system. You want to use subjects who have not had any previous experience in using the system. Otherwise, if they have been exposed, you know, to the usage of that system, which means they have a prior knowledge, it means kind of bias you are introducing. So getting this kind of population and sample, you know, could be very, could be a Herculean task. And then, and then involves a lot of money. And when, when you, when you talk about, um, assigning people to a, a, um, a, a treatment group. They have to accept for, for them to be treated. Understand? Maybe you want to administer a certain drug or administer a start certain uh, system. And I want to check if the usage of system is better with this group that uses it and than other group that doesn't use it. Understand? They must agree you know, to the terms of the research, which must be clearly spelled out to them at the beginning. And they have to willingly and voluntarily accept to do, you know, which may take a lot of their time and the rest, you know. So such things, um, experimentation is not um, that very easy, you know. Even the, you look at the youth out, they don't do any experiments to validate the youth out. They only use the surveys, understand? They use surveys and run the PLSM. So you can decide to use your survey and collect data. It could be also, um, because when it comes to the different ways of doing research, you know, we also have the missed method research that combines the qualitative. But when you are using the quasi, when you are using uh, the missed method research, you know, you have to give a priority to either the quantitative or the qualitative. Which one do you collect data first? Understand? Are you collecting quantitative data first, and then and then try to validate 
and then compare it with the qualitative data to know if you have you know the same you know um, outcome understand or are you going to collect collect you know so we have a we, we have a description if you look at the, the textbook we have a description of what is you know you know sometimes we have longitudinal you know we have cross-sectional and longitudinal research longitudinal they collect it at different times understand you know sometimes you introduce the system and then text conduct your experimentation then after three months again you do another one after then six months you do another one understand and then compare the data maybe you could be able to find that maybe some of the factors that were there at the beginning we are not there after they have become customized you know accustomed to using the system this is the kind of research you see in ix you know you know so you can do a kind of um, longitudinal you know different time frames understand you know or at the same time you know cross-sectional so depending on what you want to do you know so very much in qualitative research you know theories uh, does the same thing you know as in quantitative but in a quantitative positive studies you usually use a hypothesis informed by a theory but in qualitative too you may not be unless you are doing a theory texting understand positivist um theory texting which is very rare if you read them um, you know this man what's the name of this guy you know who's a very notable figure you know what's his name uh, mayors understand so mayors they will tell you that positivist case studies or positivist theory testing are very rare they are very rare in qualitative research understand so what you have more is theory building understand so someone might say to use okay human capital theory or structuration theory and then try to use it in use it as as a lens you know to guide you in conducting a qualitative research understand so that may be very helpful and then you look at the constructs of the theory understand look at the concept of the theories the concept of the theory will will tell you how much you know what's the kind of data you have to collect within and the kind of questions you have to because using this and um, using the, the like using the 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 um youth house as an example understand one can decide to maybe do a qualitative study using the youth out understand but really i've never seen it anywhere understand i've never seen anyone using youth out for a qualitative there are some other theories that you may find relevant for, for what you are trying to investigate. Um, so when you, when you have those theories, when you have a, such a theory, you look at the claim. Every theory has a claim, you know, which has kind of all this hypothetical relationship. When you understand the central claim of the theory and the different constructs, understand that defines the different relationship in that theory, you might want to text if one of these constructs or uh, the, the, the overall theory, you know, you know, predicts whatever you are trying to investigate. In, in this case, you might not be trying to confirm the theory, but you want to take kind of explore the reality using an existing theory, kind of an exploration, an, an exploratory, an exploratory research, you know. Exploratory research doesn't mean you don't need it. You don't need a theory. So whether you are doing quantitative or you are doing qualitative, you need a theory. Understand? So if you use um, a qualitative theory, you, the, the constructs are no longer going to be measurable. Understand? The construct has to be you know, conceptualized in such a way that you need to ask people questions. Instead of using a survey to collect, maybe you know, on, a, on a Likert scale, and because most of this, when we are talking about the content uh, validity, the different questions that are measures or scales for measuring a construct, most of these questions you ask people, you know, does the use of this system, you know, um, enable you to do your job better? Then you expect them to answer on a five point Likert scale, maybe agree, disagree, or strongly, the anchor maybe um, disagree or um strongly agree 
understand you so so agree or strongly agree in this case that Laker scale that five point Laker scale is a, a kind of quantifying you know the responses and that's why when you are using a Laker scale you have to use it in such a way that you know uh, there has to be the kind of an interval um interval relationship between one and five so that one is lesser and then a five is stronger and you have to be consistent through the whole survey such that one should be the lesser or the lowest and five should be the strongest so if you do it in such a way that the five becomes the lowest and one is the strongest it's a kind of counterintuitive and um, some of your respondents may not understand it that way so what it means that when someone says i'm answering agree that is number two it shows that the number two is different from number one and when someone says strongly agree number five means five is stronger than two or three or one you know so it has to be that way so you can now quantify this in a in a when you're doing a quantitative study but in a in, in a qualitative study you are using this kind of theory it's no longer trying to quantify maybe ask the question um quantifying it using a Likert scale type you might be answering asking question does this the use of this system aid you to do your job uh, in a, an interview question an open-ended understand semi-structured you know interview questions which is the norm so semi-structured and the person say yes yeah, because it helped me then you're collecting you are going deeper and deeper you understand you are going deeper and deeper you are collecting more data than you can ever get you know that's why qualitative studies are kind of you know very very useful when you want to go into an in-depth understanding of the phenomenon you are trying to study so you might decide to triangulate the study do a quantitative and then do a qualitative and then do a kind of comparison between the outcomes you know of of the research because so in quantitative you are you are only collecting numbers in qualitative now the respondent tells you deeper deeper what the use of this system does for her in her life and you get more data but you have to face the difficulty of analyzing the data to really understand what is going on and that's why you need theory if you don't have theory in a qualitative study tell me how do you address the kind of question you are going to raise to answer the research question you are raising it is the theory that helps you to understand the what type of question you are most likely to ask in order to get data that will give you insight or that will answer the research question you have posed at the beginning of your research so without a theory for qualitative study you will not even know what questions to ask you see why it is very important that we have theory both in qualitative and quantitative study you know so do we need to take a break and then yes. come back come back again okay it's almost like a, it's almost like nine o'clock so we come back at 9 15 then i will share a slide from professor chatterjee which will now give us a concrete you know understanding of how to actually build a theory from from the from the from the beginning you know so meanwhile i will have to stick around here for anybody who wants to share some useful information i'm rick remember that you and i we still have them cryptography exams yeah um actually i really have to go to the bathroom but i was gonna ask you um uh, mohammed stop recording um do you think So um, courtesy of uh, Professor Chatterjee, you know, everything we have here is theory, you know, makes sense of the observable world, you know, by ordering relationship among elements that constitutes the theory's focus. It could be a description, explanation, representation, observe, experience, phenomena, you know, theory building or theorizing. Natural science and human science have many theories. Applied fields like IT, you see, we don't have much theories in IT field. 
medicine. Marketing and medicine. So because we are applied fields, we are lacking in theory. So some of the theories we have are like natural sciences and then human science. We have many theories. You know. um, the kernel theories. Carrying out the actual research and the law principles. So here is for like divine, because we are talking about theories. So like um, we are connecting everything together. Quantitative, qualitative, design science, theory is theory everywhere. And in, in design science research, you need a theory. And the straw, um, Gregor mentioned the last type of theory we have in IX is the design and action theory. Theory for design and action. Theory for design and action provides prescriptive principles for designing and act, constructing an artifact. Prescriptive principles, you know, for designing or constructing an artifact. The problem and the challenge we have in design science is because the nature of the artifact we design sometimes, most times, is new artifacts, novel artifacts. And most times, it could be an existing artifact that needs to be redesigned in a new way to make it more effective and more efficient. But whenever you are designing an artifact, you need a theory to inform the design. And from definition, they say the theory for design and action are prescriptive, they provided prescriptive principles in designing an artifact. Now, it is hard most times to find a theory that actually gives you principles, prescriptive principles that prescribes, you know, the actions you have to take, you know, or the stages you have to follow in designing an artifact. That's the challenge we have. Finding such theories might be very difficult. When you are dealing with um, when you are dealing with a wicked problem, that is a weird problem that requires some creativity that doesn't have existing solutions or solution at all, a problem that relies on kind of a, you need a, some level of creativity, you know, intuition you know, to really structure the problem, to make sense of the problem, to solve an existing problem, you know, in a very creative and innovative way. And it's usually, a designing a technological artifact. We are not designing any other thing. Understand? We are not designing any other thing. Rather, we are designing IT artifacts. That is man-made objects to solve organizational problems. The construction of these artifacts must be informed by existing kernel theories. That is reference theories. These reference theories might be from IX or may not be from IX. The problem and the difficulty, finding principles, theoretical principles, you may not find, you may not find a theory that gives you, you know, step-by-step -step principles on how to design an artifact. You may not find a theory, such a theory. But the theories in generally, in general, you know, informs or provides. Well, let's say, Professor Monk, we say, uh, such theories it gives you an inspiration on how to go about the design of the artifact. Let me use, for example, you are designing an artifact and you, you don't have any kind of theory in mind. And they, Maybe you decide to use UTOUT. One would ask, how does UTOUT as a theory of or model inform the design of an artifact? Okay, you, you would say, you know, having known that effort, effort expectancy will have a significant effect on behavioral intention to adopt the piece of technology. That is behavioral intention we pray predict usage in the final term. Let us this design this artifact such that it will be very easy 
for anyone, you know, no matter the age bracket, you know, to use this theory free from much effort. There are some softwares, maybe it may be in the way of designing a very friendly user interface such that elderly people, you know, generations, different generation, generation Z, generation, whichever the way they call it, you know, elderly people, senior, young people can interact seamlessly with a with, with a user interface. So one would say that it is effort expectancy, which is a construct from without that informs you know, such a design. It doesn't offer you prescriptive principles, step by step on how to design the artifact, but it provides a certain inspiration on what to do. There are other theories out there that might inform what you are trying to design. But if you are looking for a kind of theory that we give you a, a step by step, step one, step two, step three, step four, and then final step, you have the artifact. Such theories are not in existence. Does that make sense? Are you there? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah. Listen. Yeah, I'm no longer seeing faces so. Because so, you know, so, um, this is I haven't studied it yet, this one. So that's why I'm not for like learning now. Okay. For yeah. So yeah. So now you you do the carrying out the actual research work, the research project. Maybe that's the designing the artifact. It may be the second stage. So I'm discussing theory now. I'm not this I'm not discussing design science. I won't go beyond discussing about theories. I understand? Because you, some of you have not, maybe, I don't know if you have taken the design science research yet. You do the actual research work, maybe, which is maybe uh, designing the artifact. And when you are designing the artifact, now you discover that the artifact becomes a text, a kind of, you are also evaluating the theory by designing the artifact. Because the artifact you are designing embodies the theoretical principles. That is design principles. Because that's what makes the difference between a routine design from a design science. Design science is a research paradigm. And you know that like to because it is scientific, it's something scientific. It is, it is research. In research, it makes a contribution to knowledge. There is always a theory. A routine design, anybody can design anything, understand, to solve a problem. But, but that may be just ordinary routine design. It doesn't embody theories, it's not inspired by any theory. So, but design science is inspired by theory. So this theory, you know, underlines, you know, the scientific nature of the artifact you are designing. Because this artifact not only solves the problem in the organization, but it's a kind of evaluating how this theory works in practice. So because the artifact embodies the theoretical constructs, the output of the theory may be design principles. Or it could even be a design theory. If you have that level of um, maybe a deeper conceptualization of the problem, a deeper analysis, you know, to be able to come up with a theory. But usually it is difficult. Making a theoretical, con make, making a theoretical contribution in, term, in terms of a design theory could be very difficult. Usually people can come up with instantiations, they can come up with framework, they can come up with models, uh, they can come up with new methods like algorithms, and, but coming up with a design theory is difficult. It's really difficult. So this is all about uh, kernel theories and the, how they inform what they're doing. So theory building is messy, they say. Eh? You know, a theory should pay attention to key three criteria, the purpose of the theory, building a fault, attention to the boundary of the theory, 
and then promote cohesion among the choices throughout the building efforts. You know, the purpose, why are you building the theory? What kind of theory uh, do you want to, what an aspect of phenomenon you really want to understand better, you know, to provide a better explanation of what is going on there. Defines the purpose, what's the boundary? What should be, what's the scope, the scope of this, uh, of the theory you are building? So, Uh, did Clement freeze? I think, yeah. Yeah. Clement, you're freezing. Oh, I'm freezing. That's the network. I don't know. Can you hear me yeah, now? Yeah, now you're good. Yeah. good. yeah, so it's the network. Sometimes the network is you know, very unstable. Thank God you can hear me now. So there are three levels of theories. You know, we have the grand theories. These grand theories are usually what we call the kernel theories. You know? So we have... Um, the theory of human capital, as an example here, is a grand theory. They have the widest boundaries, you know, aligned with quantitative philosophical orientation and aim to establish generalizability. You see, in, in quantitative studies, we have more of these grand theories in quantitative than in qualitative. You know, we have more theories in positivist. If we look at natural theory, I mean, natural science, natural science is grounded in positivist philosophical orientation. And here is where we have more theories than, than the qualitative um, paradigm. So we have mid-range theories. These are more specific than grand theories. They tend to be categorical, explaining relationship that exists, predicting outcomes within a, bound, a bounded domain. They don't have a greater scope. And they do not attempt universal laws. Grand theories can can establish universal laws of nature. They love, they love, we have a lot of them in the, the, the law of thermodynamics, the first law, the light of optics. You know, in optics, we have a lot of theories, universal laws, you know, in natural sciences. These are grand theories that, you know, universal laws. But in mid-range theories, they don't, they don't establish universal, they have a kind of boundary and then, and the generalization, there are some degree of generalizability or transformability, but not as wide, you know, as the grand theory. The, the local theories are um, like bounded in context. So what we usually produce in design science research are like bounded theories that are bounded to the context, that are so tightly coupled to the context, you know, so that the context becomes part of the theory. You take the, you take the, um, outside the context, the theory loses its meaning. They may not generalize. Because do you know, do you, you know why? When we are solving a problem in design science, for instance, we are solving a problem for a particular context. The problem has a context, it's contextual. You may be solving a problem of, um, um, you have a, maybe like an, an industry is going pro having problem with their payroll, with their payroll system. So you decided to design as a, a design science researcher, to design an artifact that solves the problem with a payroll. You see, if you are able to build a theory based on your research, the theory is coupled with that payroll within that organization. But you may be able to generalize to similar contexts, but not beyond that. So the theory is titled coupled with a um, you know, payroll manage management system. And it can go beyond that. And if it is like an, in, an industry, it might be applicable to industries operating on similar dynamics and or similar context, but you can't take it beyond that context. You see? So you can't take it beyond that context. So that's what it means, what they mean here by, um, by local theories. Okay, now, now look at ways of building a theory. You have the deductive method, which we have already mentioned. What well, this is, if you know these things are from the beginning, almost like every other thing is like presenting it in different ways. So you, you have a theory of to practice and then deduction to induction. From the general, you establish a particular conclusion. Usually we don't have a problem with this. Where we have a problem is from inductive, you know, from, from, um, in deductive, you move from general conclusion to establish a particular 
Um, but from a particular instance, you know, then you establish a general conclusion. And then here from a particular instance, um, and no, you move in the in deduction, you are moving from from general to you are moving from this year from particular to general and from general to particular. Understand? So that's the way you build here. So deductive to inductive, you're moving from particular to establish a general principle, or you're moving from establishing a general principle to a particular conclusion. And the way you do it, first of all, you um, you up, usually every theory building starts with um, it starts with um, an observation. When you observe observe your phenomenon, then you try to conceptualize. Understand? When you conceptualize, like conceptualization, that's when I, I told you about defining the construct. What's the meaning of the construct? Then operationalization. How are you going to measure them? Understand? Then you um, apply the theory to the particular context and then confirm it. Then keep on refining. Look at Popper here again. So scientific knowledge will advance most rapidly through development of new ideas and attempts to falsify them. Yeah, it will be very more clearly when as we proceed. So it is usually you conceptualize, you operationalize. Conceptualization is the defining each construct, the meaning of this each construct, like performance expectancies is, a, is that um, maybe you, that I will be able to perform my job free from effort. Um, okay. Um, Using this system will contribute to my job performance. That is a kind of the meaning of the construct. You try to conceptualize it, then operationalize it. You are trying to make it measurable. How are you going to measure it? Then you apply it, you know, to the circumstance, to the phenomenon, confirm it, and then keep on refining. Because every theory is going through a continuous process of refinement. So, and you go through major stages. In the descriptive stage, you are simply analyzing the reflect the relationships. In the normative stage is when this theory will start to kind of have some level of generalization to predict with accuracy what will happen if 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 certain con if certain conditions are actually met. You understand? So so that is the pro that's the issue here. So the, the deductive process you predict, you apply, and then so it begins with conceptualization and operationalization. That is you observe. The phenomenon you describe what you have seen and then you measure the phenomenon that is the constructs then with that you begin to categorize based upon the attributes of the phenomenon frameworks and then here we have the model of association the model you come up with the model remember that a model is not a theory understand i have to go now thank you clement see you next week Rick is gone um yeah, okay, now I'm Rick. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Good night. So, we're almost rounding up. So, this is the way you build a theory. First of all, you do an observation, you know, collect the data, describe what you have collected, and then measure. That is conceptualization and operationalization here. And then you begin to tie every aspect of the phenomenon together. Come up with framework or typologies. And then you can now build models, statement of association. And it is through the deductive process and the inductive process. When there is an anomaly, you refine again. You see, like that in the intelligence, distinction between theoretical and empirical concepts. We have a construct A and then construct B. A is the independent variable, here is dependent variable. So like the I intelligence is the construct you are measuring. So the dependent variable is the IQ score. The IQ score, that is the independent variable that we predict, the dependent variable. And then this is earning potential. And then this one is the starting salary. So the I, I, IQ score here will predict, you know, the type of salary you will have, you know, depending on maybe say the level of education, and then we predict the start income salary. So you have it constructs A and B. You know, there's always in every theory, you know, dependent and independent variables. So you have to be able to mention it. It's very important. If you are writing the qual exams and then you are doing a positivist study, please define 
you are variables. Which ones are the dependent and independent variable? If you are doing it partially square, you know, PLSM, or you're doing any of the covariate basing, always try to define your variables very clearly. If you don't define them, you are messing up the whole research. So you have to state exactly what are the dependent variable and the independent variable. In that way, you are st this, your st statement of relationships becomes very clear to whoever is looking at your model. So look at the construct is an abstract concept, specifically chosen, created, explain a given phenomenon. That is what the construct is. And the variable is anything that is measurable. So you have to construct, you have to construct, and then you have measures. The measures are the variables for the construct. We have, we have latent variables like intelligence, variables that you cannot measure empirically, directly. So you have to measure them. You have to devise measures that can be uh, that are observable measures to measure an unseen variable, that a latent variable. There are also variables you can measure, for instance, like weight, you know, human weight. Weight is not a latent variable because you can actually measure it directly. So, but when you are dealing with PLSM, usually, you know, you are working with latent variables, latent variables, variables like intelligence that cannot be um, measured directly, but it can be measured indirectly you know, through um, all, all these measurement scales. So we have the dependent variables, that is those that I don't need to mention, we all just know about this, you know, those that explain by other variables, you know, variables that explain other variables are called independent, and then those are explained by the dependent, you know, criterion variables and the, and the whole lot. We have moderating variables, you know, so plus, minus, which means efforts, has a lot to play to determine the level of in academic achievement and intelligence and earning potential. More efforts, more earning. Less efforts, less earning potential. So this is a, a mediating variable, you know. Academic achievement is a mediating variable and then moderating variable here is effort. So when you put more efforts, you increase your academic performance. And then your academic achievement here decide how much you earn. So moderator, so you see the influence of your moderator. Moderator exerts, the, you know, as the the impact of a moderator is either put more impact of moderator defines the the output of this academic achievement. So more efforts, effort becomes a moderate a moderator variable here because more efforts, more academic achievement, but uh, academic achievement here is mediating variable. So the more academic achievement one attains, the more any potential. Always remember this thing when you forget about moderating variables and then and then mediating. So it's a mediator and the moderator. So I mm, don't need to go through all this regression analysis statistics are typically used for correlation we when we are when we come to quantitative we are going to take we, we're going to see most of those things so, because we have to go now anomaly improving it when there is an anomaly you you refine a theory anomaly and refining so we may not need to go to transition from normative theory so first of all at the beginning of the theory yeah, the, the, there are two phases in, in a building a theory the descriptive phase and the normative phase at the, at the descriptive phase you only do, you are just stop at the level of describing what is going on in the phenomenon. When you have understood what is going on in the phenomenon, which is when you have understood the causes and you're able to explain accurately what is going on, you have understood the causal dimension of what is going on in the, in the, in the phenomenon, then you get to the level of normative theory, you know? So at this level of normative theory, the theory can, you know, actually give you, describe what is going to happen. And then it comes out, and can be able to predict accurately what is going to happen. He says, for example, here, a study shows that it's a negative correlation between a student's anxiety before test and the student's score on the test. But we cannot say that anxiety causes lower score on the test. There could be other reasons. The student may not have studied well, for example. So the correlation here does not imply causation. Yeah, correlation does not imply causation here. Yeah. However, consider the pro positive correlation between the number of hours you spend studying for a test and the grade you get out of the test. 
Here, there is causation as well. If you spend more time studying, it results in a higher grade. So correlation is not causation. When you are doing a causal study, you know, you originally do regression. But if you want to end up at a level of description, simply describing what is going on, can do correlation. Correlation is not causation. In correlation, you try to understand the impact of one variable on another, and they don't go beyond that. But if you want to understand the causal mechanism, then you do regression or other covariate based ANOVA, MANCOVA. They all take care of um, causation. So it is the same thing. So a theory completes the transition from descriptive to normative when it can give a manager unambiguous guidance about what actions will and will not lead to desired results when given the circumstances she finds herself. That is prediction. Normative theory means that a theory can now predict accurately what is going to happen given the same contingent conditions. So, so you move from descriptive theory to you know statement of causality so you observe describe and measure the phenomenon from here and then the categorization um frameworks and typologies around here and then statement of mo model instead of model here you have statement of causality so with all this now you can build you have a normative theory so you transit from here you know from predict deductive process and then to statement of if we're able to state causality usually use regression or other um, covariate based analysis to understand the causal dimension or mechanisms and structures at work then you can build a normative theory that's why building a theory is not easy because for you can for you to have a statement of causality you must have understood everything consider every situation within the boundary of that theory and it is not something you can finish in just one paper. Understand? You must have checked all the con. For instance, if it's something that you may be working, uh, you can do, sometimes you can conduct a research in the summer. And based on the climate in the summer, you conclude on your research. But you have not you have not tried it in the winter. You have not tried it in the spring. And so if you're coming like with a theory that predicts that weather, you must have tried the different weathers. For instance, perhaps you, it is still uh, bounded you have to check other countries, understand? And also their weather in Nigeria, it is different. So for the theory may be still limited in terms, in terms of statement of causality. So you may not end up getting a grand theory that has larger applicability, like a world that can, has a wider scope. So it might still be a mid-range theory, for instance. Maybe it works well in the US. It can predict things accurately in the US, but not outside the US because you, at all, it can predict something accurately during springtime, but not in winter, you know. So this statement of causality is very, very necessary if you have to have a normative theory, so which is not an easy thing. So, guys, um, we have to stop here. So normative beliefs, control beliefs, intention, behavior. So this is a theory of planned behavior. One of the theories that informed the... Um, the Utah theory, you know. So we are not dealing with this theory anymore because all of them are contained in the Utah. You know, theory of planned behavior. It was, you know, uh, one of the theories at the beginning. That also this theory also informed the term, you know, perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use. So you can see intention and behavior. So we don't need to bother. Nobody's gonna ask you to use them anymore because. Perceived usefulness. This is from time. Time is no longer you in use. Don't use time again. You know. So, Shelley Gregor. So, like we saw these things already. You know. So, so uh, <clears throat> Clement, sorry to interrupt you. Is this for the design research course? Yes. Do you see it easy or hard? Like in terms. No, no, no. The two, we, are, we are talking about theory. Like this night, we are trying to go through theory in quant, qual, and then design science. That is basically the same thing we are saying from the beginning. So, yeah, because I'm seeing that there is a lot of mixing between qual and quant. A lot, a lot of mixing. Yeah, a lot of mixing, but, but how like they, like when they, I don't know, I have to look for the exam, the qualifying. Wait, do you mean in terms of theory? Huh? I, do you mean in terms of theory, there's a lot of mix? 
Yeah, in terms of theory, yeah. So, Was like, it? yeah, I'm sorry if I bother you with the question because um, I haven't studied the design research yet. But in general, like the outcome, the, like in the end, they ask you to design a research that involved with the humans, right? Design research that like, involves like, yeah. like, like, the, the way that we design the research, can you give me an idea about it if you don't mind? Like how, how like what makes a difference between, like for example, like in qualitative, we study the method, research methods and interviews, right? And then quantitative, we study, we, we study like the, uh, the data analysis thing, you know? Uh, like the measurement and some other thing, but in the design research, what is about? Do you have an idea about it? You build, you, you are building, you are building something. In design science, you are building an artifact. If you are not building an artifact, you are not doing design science. You have to build an artifact. You have to build a, a software. You have to build an object. You know, you, you can, it, you can, it can be a framework for understanding something. It could be an instantiation, like building a technological device. It could be like a software. It can be an algorithm that you came up with. It could be a method of solving a problem. It could be a framework of understanding something. You know, so these are the outputs of the design science research. So it could be an instantiation. An instantiation is like an, a software. So when it comes to designing something, a product, we're talking about design. So if your research, you know, it takes you to designing something, an actual object or a software. Then you think about doing it a design science research. Touch. Then in design science research, you can still use quantitative and qualitative measures to evaluate the artifact you are building. Got you. Yeah. So if you if, if you mean want to build something, think about design science. Because in quantitative, we are trying to understand, you know, have a kind of conceptual understanding of what is going on in order to maybe draw from, um, from the theory and apply it in practice. You know, it's not so much about designing anything. It's more about trying to understand humans and the computers, how the humans as they interact with computers in organizational settings. Understand. So in qualitative, you're trying to understand it deeper. You use qualitative because you want to go deeper in understanding the reality. You know, you want to understand people in the in their context. Because quantitative is not interested in the context. Context is noise for, for quantitative uh, research. So you're only simply trying to understand the factors, you know, constructs using theories, gathering numerical data to analyze, to understand what is going on. But there is a higher degree of accuracy, understand, because you are dealing with numbers. That's why many, even many researchers or scholars denied the, um, um, for them, the qualitative study doesn't have reliability, doesn't, it's not valid, but that is not true. Understand, when you want to understand someone, this is, there is two different things, asking someone uh, on, a, on a five scale uh, measure, you are, your um, satisfaction with this product and the person said okay five okay five over five means i'm strongly i'm fully satisfied but then the quantitative the qualitative researcher comes ask you about your satisfaction and say oh the, it was the product is very good very nice in fact the first day i used it i was able to able to help me to do even my little baby also used it that it works for him so it works for all of us in the family all my children so did you get a better understanding of the satisfaction? So it's right. not just about the person who's being satisfied. So even the kids in the family, oh, you have gotten a, the deeper idea that, oh, even kids, we are also, so even everybody in the family was satisfied. So but the quantitative survey researchers are interested in numbers. Get the five positive, the Likas scale, you know, on a, on a scale of five. It goes with its five and analyzes its five with accuracy. But this person has to border with a lot of data. You know the qualitative research but you have a deeper idea you know of what is actually going on which will inform you know your further um which will help you to it kind of predict what is most probably to happen or it helps you to understand 
better what is going on in that scenario, you know, in that context, which will also yeah. have implication, implication to practice. It can also have implication to practice. Maybe having discovered that it also children are also involved, you might go in and begin to design something for for kids, make it more kids friendly, you know. So, so that's the difference. And yeah, also we can. I think we can use a quantitative like to test the quality of the product. You know, like, the quality of something. Yeah, like yeah, like do for example to some tests and then repeat the test and then keep repeating the test and then comparing. You know, I think yeah, also could be for that. Yes, can be a kind of experimentation. You know, randomize. Yeah. Try it with different populations and see what's the outcome. We call it tri triangulation in research. Understand? Triangulation, which means you either collect maybe quantitative or qualitative data at the same time or at different time frames and do some comparison. Or you can triangulate the population. You might use people in Africa and then try with other people in the US to see. You can use college students and then master students with different population to understand better. So you cannot triangulation of subjects can also be a tri triangulation of data, collect qualitative, quantitative data. This we call it triangulation. And triangulation gives you more validity to your research. You know, it adds more validity to your research. It shows you really go, you went in depth to understand what is going on from different perspectives. You know, so not just collecting data on in one in one context. Yeah. You're right, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for the clarification, man. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. And um, I don't know who, who, who is still remaining. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, still okay. and Mohammed. Oh, hmm. Only two yeah, of yeah, us. Mohammed. Only two or three of us remaining here. All right, guys. I well, thank it, you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, nice. Mohammed, try and upload. When you go to the Google Drive folder, you see a Zoom recordings. Upload everything you have to that folder, the Zoom recording folder on, on Google Drive. Okay, we'll do so. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you, guys. We're going to meet next Monday. Maybe we, today we have come to the end of um, introduction to IX research. Okay. On Sunday. If um, then as we continue, if there are other, we are not limited.